A very warm welcome to this latest Science AAAS webinar entitled Targeted Protein Degradation, Controlling and Assessing Therapeutic Targets to Advance Oncology Drug Discovery. My name is Sean Sanders and I'm Director and Senior Editor for Custom Publishing at Science. Thank you to Cell Signaling Technology for sponsoring today's webinar. Targeted protein degradation is an emerging research strategy centered around using small molecules called degraders to trigger ubiquitin-dependent degradation of specific proteins. This approach shows promise for oncology drug development for many reasons, including the ability to selectively disrupt critical signaling pathways, target previously inaccessible cancer-causing proteins, and overcome drug resistance. Degradation-based strategies also complement basic genetic experiments while offering better target selectivity and enabling functional studies with superior kinetic resolution. Proteomics approaches often work in concert with degradation-based technologies, enabling the discovery of biomarkers, potential therapeutic targets, and a better understanding of therapeutic response across the whole proteome. In this webinar, the speakers will discuss strategies to target oncogenic signaling networks via selective control of protein homeostasis, while highlighting the impact of this approach on cancer therapeutics research. I'm very fortunate today to be joined by two fantastic speakers who will introduce us to this topic. Dr. Benan Nabet from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, and Dr. Matt Stokes from Cell Signaling Technology in Danvers, Massachusetts. We are going to start off with a short presentation from Dr. Stokes, who will provide an overview of the technology that our second speaker, Dr. Nabet, used in his work. Uh, by way of introduction, Dr. Stokes joined Cell Signaling Technology in 2005 as a scientist in the Cancer Discovery Group and moved to the Proteomics Group in 2009, where he is currently Director, leading Proteomics Services, Product Development, and Research. So, uh, a warm welcome to you, Dr. Stokes. Thank you, Sean, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to give just a little intro and, and talk a bit about how uh, we use mass spectrometry-based proteomics in our research. Um, and, you know, a question that we get a lot is, wait, you do proteomics? I thought CST was a, an antibody company. And in fact, we've had a keen interest in proteomics and started doing uh, mass spec-based proteomics all the way back in 2003. And we developed some methods for deep coverage of uh, protein post-translational modifications. And we've, we've published now hundreds of, of papers to date, uh, including uh, the one shown here. This is uh, one of the initial uh, papers looking at uh, tyrosine phosphorylation in cancer cells and cancer signaling. Uh, but of course, as an antibody company, it did all start with antibodies and this really unique and cool class of antibodies that we developed over the years. So typically when we're developing an antibody, we use a single peptide or piece of a protein or even a whole protein as the antigen. Here we're showing a phosphopeptide. Um, but the antibodies that we use for this mass spec based approach are a little bit different. So instead of a single peptide as the antigen, we actually use degenerate peptide libraries. So again, here we have a phosphopeptide and we have a phosphoserine and then an arginine at minus three. So we fix those two residues in the library and then vary all the other amino acids around them. And we use that library of peptides as the antigen. And when we do this, we get antibodies that are really very specific for that targeted motif. In this case, RXX phospho S, but broadly reactive against a lot of different primary amino acid sequences. So we can do this for phosphorylation motifs. We can also do it for other post-translational modifications like we're showing here with acetylysine. We can then use these uh, antibodies in the, in the method, and we've profiled all different kinds of samples using this methodology. So we've done cell lines and tissues, and sorted cells, whole organisms, plant material, microbial samples, even serum or plasma. And one of the first things that we do is we digest to peptides. And so we're doing now peptide level enrichments with our specialized PTM or motif antibody. We take that enriched material, we run it in mass spec, get our peptide identifications and identify the sites of modification that we're seeing. And then we can do quantitative analysis to tell us 
what's going up or what's going down between various treatments, say minus plus a, a degrader. And over the years, we've built up this whole list of all of these different PTMs that we can look at using this method. So obviously phosphorylation, serine threonine, tyrosine, but other things as well, like ubiquitination, which obviously has applications in the, the degrader field, or things like looking at methylation of lysine, methylation of arginine. So a quick example of kind of how we've used this technology internally in some of our research. And this was a paper we published a few years ago looking at tyrosine phosphorylation in ovarian cancer. So we profiled a whole bunch of ovarian samples using this method, again, looking at tyrosine phosphorylation. And in a subset of those, we identified some really abundant phosphopeptides to the receptor tyrosine kinase alpha. We did some follow-up work and identified a novel gene fusion of ALK and FN1. And then importantly showed that cells harboring this ALK-FN1 fusion are really sensitive to chrysotinib. So over on the left, we have a look at uh, tumor growth over the course of a week. The green line is the vehicle control. And then the blue line is with chrysotinib treatment. You can see that growth of that tumor is almost completely abrogated uh, by the presence of chrysotinib. Over on the right, a little bit more of a molecular look, we can see strong phosphorylation of that FN1 ALK fusion uh, in the red box in the vehicle control. And again, that phosphorylation is almost completely abrogated by chrysotinib treatment. So we applied the same technology over and over again in a, in a number of different indications, a number of different cancer types. And this led us to development of antibodies against ALK. Uh, including the one shown here in the IHC image. And we even took the next step to collaborate with Ventana to create a companion diagnostic to look at ALK in lung cancer. So really kind of a cool bench to bedside story that started with this discovery proteomics. We got actionable data that we could then use to develop antibodies and get all the way to a companion diagnostic and what was called a, a significant step in the war against non-small cell lung cancer. So that's just a, a quick little example of how we use mass spec based proteomics. And I know Benam has uh, some great uh, stuff to talk about looking in uh, his field and how you can leverage mass spec based proteomics there as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stokes. Um, so our next speaker will be Dr. Benam Nabet. Uh, Dr. Nabet is an assistant professor in the human biology division at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. His laboratory is focused on developing strategies to target oncogenic signaling through controlling protein homeostasis. He pioneered development of the DTAG system to rapidly degrade any target protein, a technology that facilitates biological exploration and drug target validation in both cells and animal models. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Nabet. Thanks for being with us. Great. Thanks so much for the invitation to participate today and for the kind introduction. It's, it's really great to be joining you all uh, from, from Seattle, Washington today. So my lab is fundamentally focused on the development and deployment of uh, strategies to target oncogenic signaling networks. And we do this largely through focusing on controlling protein homeostasis. So I'm really delighted to join you all today to, to share um, some of our unpublished work and, and recently published work in the field uh, of targeted protein degradation. And, and these are my uh, conflicts of interest. Great. So today I broke my talk down into three sections. What I'd like to do first is give an overview of the field of targeted protein degradation and then highlight um, one emerging story in our, in our group that has really been leveraging uh, proteomics and the strategies that um, Matt just really nicely outlined for us today uh, our, on our focus in going after some key um, kinases in various different difficult to treat cancers. For the final section of my talk, I'd like to give an overview of a technology that we've been developing for several years known as the degradation tag or the DTAG system and rationale for why we developed it, how we've been leveraging it, and what we're continuing to work on now in my lab. 
So there's a number of different ways to be able to control target protein activity and levels. Genetic perturbations, which include CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing or SH, siRNA knockdown approaches are amazingly powerful in part because they have broad utility. Uh, these strategies can be applied to conceivably any target gene of interest. In addition, fundamentally, they're able to alter the abundance of a particular protein that's really essential for being able to study um, uh, normal processes and development and for us uh, leveraging these platforms for um, uh, cancer biology research. However, there's a number of key limitations. These include that these strategies can be slow in their kinetics of achieving protein loss. It might take several days or even weeks to develop a CRISPR uh, Cas9 edited knockout clone. And this is quite challenging uh, when one is trying to study really essential target proteins of interest um, or key players in, in oncogenesis. In addition, these strategies, it's, it's challenging to perform experiments in dose. They can be irreversible in nature. And in the past, some of these technologies have been confounded with issues of selectivity. A comparable key um, strategy, of course, is pharmacologic inhibition. For example, small molecule inhibitors are amazingly enabling because they can be very fast acting. They can also give one reversible control over protein activity. In addition, one can perform experiments in dose. However, in the field, there's some key limitations. The majority of the proteome um, is currently unliganded and undrugged. And so there's a limited availability of chemical matter available for the majority of proteins of interest that one wants to study. In addition, some chemical probes can be poorly characterized and lack selectivity. And finally, small molecule inhibitors, for example, might only target one particular activity of a target protein of interest, where there are classes of proteins that have both enzymatic and non-enzymatic functions. And so an inhibitory approach might be insufficient for uh, being able to drug that particular factor. And so what we're particularly excited about is a field referred to as targeted protein degradation or TPD. I think that this um, field really encapsulates some of the key features of genetic approaches with small molecule control and allows one to really be able to tune and control protein levels through co-opting an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so what I'd like to do today is really share with you why I'm excited about this particular field and some of the key enabling features of these types of approaches and technologies. Uh, in particular, what I want to highlight is that they're very fast acting. And so this can be quite enabling for answering all different kinds of questions, both in cancer biology, but in basic biomedical science as well. In addition, in addition these strategies are reversible. They give you tunable control over protein levels. They can have remarkable selectivity that be, can be quantified with quantitative proteomics. In addition, um, one can start to evaluate and compare inhibitors versus these small molecule degraders. We and others have found that these can give quite distinct activities, in part because these small molecule degraders are targeting the entire protein and abolishing all protein activity. We and others have shown that these strategies are quite exciting because they can be overcome, uh, they can be used to overcome mechanisms of clinical resistance to existing therapies. And I think the field is broadly very excited about these strategies because it presents a new opportunity for going after really difficult drug targets. <clears throat> so in the field now, there's many different examples of classes of these small molecule degraders. What I'll be largely focusing on today are what we think of as bifunctional degraders or proteolysis targeting chimeras or protax. And protax um, are, is a term that was coined by Ray Deshaies and, and Craig Cruz back in 2001 in their seminal uh, publication in PNAS, where they describe the first example of this particular uh, technology. So these types of molecules are bifunctional in nature, meaning that they have two ends, as I've illustrated here. On one end, they're able to engage the target protein of interest, and on the other end, they're able to engage the E3 ubiquitin ligase. So what this looks like is that these bifunctional molecules engage a target protein of interest, bind the E3 ubiquitin ligase, this induces what we call the ternary complex, which brings together the target protein and this uh, degradation machinery. As a consequence of this proximity-induced interaction, this then leads to ubiquitination and then subsequent proteasome-mediated degradation of the target protein of interest. And so what I'd like to start with is actually share with you a, a new um, story that we've been working on for several years 
going after various different kinases of interest, applying this type of degrader strategy, and uh, hopefully illustrating a bit of some of the key features of why I think targeted protein degradation in general is, is just incredibly enabling. Um, so I performed my postdoctoral work with uh, Nathaniel Gray and, and Jay Bradner at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. And during my time in Boston, uh, Nathaniel Gray's lab had been carrying out this particular study that I wanted to highlight here. And so what the Gray Lab had been focused on is trying to develop strategies to try to identify highly degradable kinases to apply these types of strategies towards. And so this molecule that I'm showing here that was developed by Tan Lee, TL1387, is a very multi-targeted kinase inhibitor. So below is a kinome, wine, uh, kinome scan experiment demonstrating that this molecule really lights up the kinome and binds various different um, kinases. What the team then did was take this particular binder and then convert it to this bifunctional uh, molecule or PROTAC. And so developing TL12186 by conjugating to thalidomide, a molecule that can recruit cerebellin as the E3 ubiquitin ligase. The team then performed a quantitative proteomics experiment asking the question, when you have such a multi-targeted agent that you know binds a lot of different kinases, what do you actually degrade? And so iteratively, the team has been developing these types of molecules with different warheads, different E3 recruiters, leveraging different, various different cell lines and contexts to iteratively answer what kinases do you routinely degrade with this type of approach. And so one that particularly caught my attention early on um, that kept showing up repeatedly was, was PTK2 or uh, focal adhesion kinase FAC. And so FAC, or focal adhesion kinase, is a really interesting target protein of interest, in part because it has a kinase domain and, and is able to regulate key, um, key downstream signaling effectors. It also has a focal adhesion targeting domain, has scaffolding functions, and um, nuclear roles as well, including a firm domain. Uh, PTK2 is commonly amplified in many different cancers, so it's co that's a common mechanism of deregulation across various different cancers, um, including pancreatic, breast, and ovarian cancer. And so this is in part why we were particularly keen on this particular factor as a target. Uh, in addition, there has been many um, studies over time leveraging various different clinical candidates that have been developed. So there are a, a series of small molecule inhibitors targeting FAC kinase activity that have been leveraged in, in the field. And a particular study from, from David Denarder lab um, that I've highlighted here uh, demonstrated that in particular combination approaches with FAC inhibitors and immunotherapy were, were quite powerful, um, leading to really remarkable efficacy in mouse models of pancreatic cancer. And the work that I'll be sharing with you today is largely in pancreatic cancer model systems. So our hypothesis was that looking at FAC organization and structure um, its mechanisms of deregulation, um, perhaps the targeted protein degradation strategy is one that we should be leveraging to go after this particular kinase. There's a series of FAC inhibitors in the clinic. Largely, they do not have um, activity in patients, unfortunately. Um, in addition, combination approaches are being um, explored, like the one that I've highlighted here from the DiNardo lab. But in general, we thought that perhaps um, an inhibition approach was insufficient for targeting FAC. So our goal over the past several years is to develop these types of um, strategies to be able to degrade um, focal adhesion kinase. And I should mention the work um, here has been led by um, uh, Baishan, who had just started his lab at Wuhan University, and two of my former technicians, Erico and Kayla. Um, Erico is now a uh, first year student, uh, graduate student at Rockefeller, and, and Kayla is finishing up her second year as a medical student at University of Vermont. So what we decided to do was actually start with this clinical candidate, VS4718, um, initially actually profiling its selectivity across the kinome, similar to that early compound that I shared. This one looks more selective, but it actually does also have significant off-target effects. So in addition to hitting FAC very potently, it does hit several other kinases. But we thought this was a potential um, nice starting point for us to start to evaluate whether or not we could actually degrade this particular kinase. So Baishan then synthesized a bifunctional molecule based on this scaffold. And this was the lead, um, or our early lead molecule, BSJ03136, named after Baishan, which really led to remarkable 
protein loss of fat here uh, measured by Western blotting at one to 10 nanomolar doses. And this is a four hour treatment in a pancreatic cancer cell line. However, then our next step was to perform a quantitative proteomics experiment with Catherine Donovan and Eric Fisher at Dana-Farber. And here just surveying the entire proteome and total protein levels to look at the selectivity of this molecule. What we were excited to see in this four hour treatment experiment at a 10 nanomolar dose was that we had really pronounced loss of FAC. However, we hit several other kinases that this um, VS4718 bound. So we were degrading we one or our kinase A, um, STK33, a number of different key critical kinases that would potentially confound results that we would observe and attribute to FAC if we were to use this as a chemical probe moving forward. So from here, then we actually decided to step back and see if we could really develop a more selective um, a binder to FAC and then develop Protex. And so this took us several years, but taking advantage of structure guided design and crystal structures that were available, Baishan was able to develop this compound BSJ04175, which is a really highly selective FAC inhibitor. You can see that we're tuning out uh, much of the off targets of BS4718. From this lead molecule, then we went and from our learnings in our early generations of molecules, developed this lead compound BSJ04146, which is really incredibly selective for FAC. And so we were really encouraged by these early um, chemistry results and biochemical data that we had been generating and the improvement that we were seeing with these different molecules. So then we went back into cells and Erico and Kayla started testing um, these molecules. And so here's an example. This is a four hour treatment experiment in a pancreatic cancer cell line. And in the middle here is BSJ04146, the PROTAC molecule. And so again, we're able to degrade FAC at a 10 nanomolar dose. Uh, with the inhibitor, we do not degrade FAC. And we also like to develop bifunctional control molecules that can bind the target. So in this case, binding FAC, but then not able to bind the E3 ubiquitin ligase. So we add uh, a methyl group to thalidomide, and this abrogates binding to cerebellum. So this is a really nice bifunctional head-to-head -head control that can inhibit but not degrade um, FAC. And so what we were able to see with these molecules is we're only perturbing protein levels with our PROTAC. In addition, what got us very excited early on was looking at a downstream signaling effector uh, phosphorylation of AKT. We saw that at this 10 nanomolar dose, we're really hitting phos uh, phospho-AKT, with the inhibitor, it takes a tenfold increase in, in dosing to be able to modulate downstream signaling. In addition, these effects are largely abrogated with the head-to-head -head bifunctional control molecule, suggesting to us that perhaps in line with our hypothesis, degrading FAC is starting to impact downstream signaling um, quite differently than the inhibitor itself. So from here, excited about our biochemical and early cellular data, we turn back to a the quantitative proteomics experiment with our colleagues at Dana-Farber and really confirmed the, the incredible selectivity of our molecule. So now um, compared to our early experiments, we've tuned out all the um, off-target effects that we were seeing with our early generations of the compounds. From here, then we were really excited to team up with um, Matt and his team at Cell Signaling Technology and, and leverage their quantitative proteomics assays uh, that Matt really nicely outlined um, for us here today. And so what we decided to do based on our early Western blotting experiments was ask the question of how are we impacting differentially downstream phospho signaling when we compare our inhibitor um, to our PROTAC. And so here uh, we did a both dose and time dependent assessment. And I'm just showing here the four hour, uh, our earliest time point was four hours that we examined comparing the inhibitor to the PROTAC. And largely with the inhibitor, we really see no um, functional consequences on, on phospho signaling. Uh, when we treat with the compound. However, really excitingly with the PROTAC, we start to see really dramatic changes across the phosphoproteome, hitting a number of different factors when we do pathway assessments that are involved in cell adhesion, cell migration, um, and in particular, highlighting the potential um, uh, scaffolding roles that FAC has in pancreatic cancer as a key mechanism of, of destabilization when we actually degrade FAC versus inhibit it. These differences that we're seeing in, in phosphorylation are then recapitulating in some of the cellular experiments that we're doing to characterize the molecules. 
And so again, back into a, the pancreatic cancer cell line that we've been leveraging, um, we've been doing comparative evaluations of our series. And what we find here on the right, um, when we culture our pancreatic cancer cell line in, in 3D, is that we see a really pronounced effect on the viability of these um, spheroid cultures compared to the inhibitor and the bifunctional control compounds. So again, we're seeing really um, exciting, we think, degradation-specific effects uh, as a consequence of completely depleting this kinase that has both kinase activities and nine kinase activities compared to when we only hit its uh, enzymatic functions. We do this experiment in 3D in part because the field has largely shown that um, perturbing FAC in 2D monolayers really does not have a much of a biologic consequence, and one needs to really um, perform these experiments in 3D or in in vivo studies. One of our longstanding goals with um, all of our technologies is really see if we can push them into in vivo evaluations. And so this is an early um, experiment that um, Kayla and Erico have have been able to perform, in which we started to assess the PK. Uh, the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of our, our small, small molecule degraders as we've been trying to develop um, a series of compounds that have activity in vivo. And so here in a xenograft experiment with our pancreatic um, cancer cell line, what we can compare are different dosing regimens where we treat um, our mice with um, our protac and, and look both in the tumor as well as um, across various different tissues to see if we achieve degradation. And what we've been really excited to see is, is this particular result where um, we either treat with a vehicle control or 15 mg per kg every other day. So these mice um, received three doses, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then were um, sacrificed one day after that final treatment or seven days after that final treatment. And then on the right is 50 mg per kg where these mice have only received one dose of the compound and then evaluated one day or seven days after that treatment. And so what we've been really delighted to see is that we can achieve really pronounced degradation um, in the tumor, as well as across uh, tissues in the mouse, uh, highlighted here by the liver. And what's been remarkable to us is the durability and the potency of this degradation. We see really pronounced loss uh, within 24 hours in the tumor, but also these seem to be largely maintained even seven days after just one treatment. And so this has got us really excited about the potential of these types of strategies for in vivo applications. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of a, a snapshot of some of the key features of, of what I think is exciting about the field of targeted protein degradation, how one can really develop highly selective tools to be able to perturb proteins that have both enzymatic and non-enzymatic functions. Um, in particular, highlighting some of our data demonstrating that we see really distinct biologic effects when you degrade versus inhibit a particular kinase in a pancreatic cancer context. Um, in addition, the remarkable uh, activity that one can achieve when pushing these types of strategies in vivo. So for the, the, the second half of my talk, what I'd like to really focus on is our development and use of our degradation tag or our D-tag system. And so as I've highlighted, these protects I think are, are remarkably enabling both for just basic biologic study because of the, the rapid kinetics of protein loss that you can achieve, but also potentially down the line as cancer therapeutics as these bifunctional molecules are rapidly progressing really excitingly um, in the clinic for various different malignancies. However, one key limitation of uh, most degradation-based campaigns is that they begin with something that can bind your target protein of interest. So to be able to develop the bifunctional molecule, you need something to be able to engage the target protein of interest. However, as I mentioned, the majority of the proteome currently remains unliganded. So what if you wanted to apply a degradation-based approach to be able to study a challenging drug target that currently does not have binding ligands? What if you wanted to validate whether or not your candidate target was worth a medicinal chemistry campaign to be able to identify binders or develop various different types of degrader or inhibitor molecules. What if you just wanted to leverage the fast kinetics that I've been um, sharing with you today for, for being able to study a key signaling effector, a key, um, key transcriptional regulator, chromatin regulator? And so these were types of the types of questions that we started to think about early on that we saw as particular um, challenges in the field and one that we sought to develop a technology platform that would allow us to address and hopefully serve as a tool. 
And so this gave rise to our degradation tag or our D tag system, um, which is a highly versatile platform that one can conceivably apply to any target protein of interest as a technology for biologic study, uh, basic target discovery and target validation efforts. And so our, our hypothesis and goal with this particular um, technology was that, well, perhaps we could take a step back, develop genetic strategies where we could fuse a universal tag to a target protein of interest, and then develop these bifunctional molecules that we call our D-tag molecules that can bind this universal tag and then bind the E3 ubiquitin ligase. As a consequence, just like those protax and the FAC protax that I just illustrated for you, this would potentially lead to this proximity-induced interaction, again, ubiquitination, in this case, of the tagged protein, and then proteasome-mediated degradation. And so what I'd like to share with you today are the steps that we've taken early on to develop um, this type of approach um, and, and some additional rationale for, for key steps that we, we took in, in trying to develop a really selective technology platform. In addition, then a couple of very um, brief examples and, and highlights of our recent efforts to leverage this study for this type of platform for um, target discovery and target validation in, in oncology. And then our more recent investigations in applying and developing the strategy for applications in mouse models. So the DTAC system is a dual component strategy. This, the first key feature is to be able to, tar your pro to tag your target protein of interest um, with this mutant version of FKBP12. So this is the tag, this FKBP12 F36 feed. We've developed strategies where one can use lentiviral or viral directed um, expression strategies or CRISPR um, Cas9 directed knock-in approaches to be able to fuse the tag to the N or the C terminus of the target protein of interest. In addition, we often include other tags um, that can be highly enabling um, when reagents or, or, or materials are, are limiting. And so in this case, for example, we leverage a tandem HA tags in a lot of the examples that I'll share with you today. The second key component is the D-tag molecule. And so we were really excited about a study that actually came out in 1998 from Tim Claxton and colleagues at Ariad Pharmaceuticals and PNES where they had outlined a bump hole strategy around this particular protein FKBP12, which is one of the favorite tools of chemical biologists. What they identified was that a mutant version of FKBP12, this F36V, creates a cavity in FKBP12. They then identified synthetic ligands that selectively could engage and bind this mutant version of FKBP12 and not the wild type. So we thought that perhaps um, if we could leverage this particular starting point, this might be a really attractive strategy to be able to get really high selectivity because of the, the mutant that is present in this particular protein. In addition, um, this uh, various flavors of FKBP12, uh, particularly double mutant versions of FKBP12, have been used as a tag um, for many years. And so an approach that was pioneered by Tom Wanless and colleagues at Stanford uh, the SHIELD approach um, leverages a double mutant version of FKBP12. And what um, they've shown over many years in many papers is that this protein really is a highly um, um, accessible and amenable um, as, a, as a tag for, for targets of interest. And so our thought was, well, we could take advantage of this mutant FKBP12 and develop bifunctional D-tag molecules to bind this tag. And so We've now published um, two lead compounds that we've nominated as really a highly selective and versatile. Uh, our first we call DTAC13, which recruits Cerebron as the E3 ligase. Um, we synthesize an analog of AP1867, the compound from Ariad, um, and actually uh, found a more uh, selective analog that we then conjugated to thalidomide in this case to recruit Cerebron. Our second molecule we call DTAC V1, um, which is very similar in structure, although it binds to VHL and recruits VHL as the E3 ubiquitin ligase. Over time, we had really stringent criteria in our evaluation of about 70 different molecules through various different assays that we developed over time. Um, importantly, these molecules are highly selective. They operate through the expected mechanism of action. And as I'll show, there are able to induce degradation across various different targets in various different cell lines and have activity in mouse models. And so the early systems that we set up to start to identify cell penetrant DTAG molecules is one that I'm showing here, which has been really powerful for us. This is our dual luciferase system where we set up two cell lines. The first cell line is our control, 
where we took wild type FKBP12 and fused it to nano luciferase. And our second cell line in red is, um, is one where we took the mutant FKBP12 and fused it to nano luciferase. We express, express these um, plasmids in, um, in 293 cells, and then we're able to screen for uh, molecules that we were developing in the lab. Um, we were excited to see this initial result with DTAC-13, where we had really potent loss of luminescent signal, indicating effective um, degradation of the fusion protein. At high doses, you might notice that there is actually an increase in signal. And this is pretty characteristic of protax or bifunctional molecules, where you see the hook effect, in which you have saturation, in this case, of the E3 ligase, uh, cerebron, um, as well as the tag here, mutant FKBP12. As a consequence, then you do not have productive ternary complex formation or degradation. The other key part of this experiment that we were excited about was the, the clear difference we saw between mutant versus wild type degradation, where we really had no activity on wild type, indicating um, to us that this would be a molecule um, that we should continue to pursue. We then performed a number of chemical and genetic rescue experiments. I'm just highlighting the genetic experiment that was key for us, where we knocked out cerebellum the E3 ligase using CRISPR. And what we were observed was in this Western blot was that uh, confirming that we could degrade um, this nano luciferase fusion with DTAC-13 treatment at 10 and 100 nanomolar, and we could completely rescue these effects when we knock out cerebellum, indicating that cerebellum indeed is required. We could then perform a number of chemical rescue experiments, such as blocking the proteasome and also rescue the effects. So from these early experiments, then we started to think about um, and, and get excited about, well, we want to now apply this strategy to see if we could actually degrade a target protein of interest that we fuse to this tag. And so we've had a longstanding interest in mutant KRAS, which is the most commonly um, mutated oncogene in cancer and a key driver of pancreatic cancer, which has been largely one of the interests of my group for many years. In particular, we're focused on lesions of KRAS that are currently undrugged. So in particular, all the experiments that I'll share with you today are around KRAS G12B. KRAS G12B and G12D are actually um, the more common mutations in, in pancreatic cancer, which has over 90% of patients presenting with a, with a, mutation, in uh, a mutation in KRAS. So we think that there's a real key need, uh, as many others do, for trying to identify and develop strategies to be able to drug um, KRAS in, in pancreatic cancer. KRAS is a key driver of many different signaling cascades, including MAP kinase signaling, AKT signaling, and RAL GDS signaling. And rightfully so, it has been the target of many different drug discovery efforts over, over decades of work. And so various different strategies have been leveraged to try to perturb KRAS directly. Major incredible advances have been recently made in drugging KRAS G12C with covalent small molecule inhibitors. However, this is a particular mutation that is pretty rare in pancreatic cancer. And so um, we've been interested in, in really studying and, and tackling some of the other uh, mutations such as KRAS G12B. And so we thought this oncoprotein was a great one for us to really leverage and vet the DTAC system and also see if we could um, uh, develop new biological insights. So one of the early systems that we set up as a control was to see if indeed, if we tagged KRAS at the end terminus, if it was functional. So in this case, what we did was we took these NIH3T3 cells, which are mouse fibroblast cells, expressed our tagged KRAS. Also experiments I'm not showing, we compared this to an untagged KRAS as well. What we found was that indeed the tagged KRAS was functional. So um, in the control lanes, you can see an increase in phosphorylation of MEK, indicating activation of MAP kinase signaling and increases in AKT signaling as well. We also saw that these cells proliferated faster. Um, they were now transformed. They could form tumors in mice, um, indicating that this, ta uh, this tagged protein is, is functional. The, the second key feature and what got us very excited was then if we treated with our DTAG molecule, we could then trigger really rapid degradation of KRAS. Within one hour, we have about 50% degradation. Within four hours, we have 90% degradation. And what was really exciting was that within one hour of treatment, we actually saw a collapse in the downstream signaling of, uh, effects. And so MAP kinase signaling and AKT signaling really went back to baseline levels. The control cells are shown uh, on the left, where DTAG does not have any effect on, on signaling um, given its high specificity, um, but also this remarkable loss and effect on, on downstream signaling. Uh, we did a whole host of uh, uh, phenotypic characterization. I'm just showing a, a cell cycle experiment where these cells indeed 
um, were proliferating faster. There were more cells in S phase as shown in red. Um, in addition, then when we treated with our DTAG molecule, within 24 hours, the cells began cycling just like the control cells. So they flipped right back to the control setting um, within, within 24 hours of treatment. From here, then, we could leverage the fast kinetics that we were reserving by Western blotting and apply quantitative proteomics approaches to really evaluate the selectivity of our, of our system. So we did a time-dependent assessment, and I'm just showing here the one-hour treatment time point to highlight the selectivity, where the only significantly depleted protein across the whole proteome that we saw was our tagged KRAS. We did not impact wild-type KRAS or, as shown here, um, uh, wild-type FKBB12 as well. This had us very excited, and our phosphosignaling Western blotting experiments as well were indicating that, as expected, we were uh, having an impact on down, the downstream phospho network. And so what we decided to couple this with was a phosphoproteomics experiment, where we confirmed that um, MAP kinase signaling um, was impacted upon KRAS loss, as one you would expect, as, uh, as you would expect here, highlighting ERK1 and ERK2 phosphocytes. In addition, we saw changes in downstream chromatin regulators and transcriptional regulators as well. This had us intrigued, so we then coupled this with, a phos uh, with an RNA sequencing experiment to look at the transcriptional changes upon KRAS degradation. I think a unique part of this, is, of this experiment that we performed was also that we could now, because of the rapid kinetics of being able to perturb KRAS within one to four hours, compare it to a clinical MEK inhibitor, so trametinib as shown here. And so in this experiment, we treated cells with either DTAG13 to degrade KRAS or, or the MEK inhibitor trametinib for four or eight hours at doses that led to comparable loss in phosphosignaling. What we observed was really high concordance between genes that were differentially expressed upon KRAS degradation or trametinib treatment. Largely within four hours, we could completely flip the aberrant transcriptional program in these cells. Um, what was also quite intriguing to us was actually that there was about 20 for 25% of the genes that were not um, impacted upon tremetin treatment, but were impacted upon KRAS degradation. So there were some key differences between the two different perturbations. And so I'll show some highlights of what we've been learning from these various different data sets that we've been generating over the years. And so I'd like to transition a little bit in, in terms of how we've been leveraging what we've been learning from these data sets that we've been generating both in these early model systems and then um, DTAG systems that we've been developing in pancreatic cancer models. These types of experiments led us to identify this prole isomerase known as PIN1 as being a particular collaborator of mutant KRAS in pancreatic cancer. To validate this target in work led by Benica Pinch, a former graduate student in Nathaniel's lab who's now at Novartis, um, developing DTAG systems to be able to degrade PIN1 to really study the consequences of PIN1 loss and confirm some of our profiling experiments, as I'm showing here. In addition, our work got us very excited about drugging this particular target. So we had two independent medicinal chemistry campaigns to actually go after PIN1 and develop covalent small molecule inhibitors. The second generation molecule, sulfapin, is one that I'm highlighting here that we developed um, in collaboration with Near London's lab that really has really remarkable activity in vitro and in vivo pancreatic model systems. The second um, target that we've been focusing on is one that we identified from our transcriptional profiling experiments, which is an understudy kinase known as DCLK1. I'll share a little bit more in depth on, on the work that we've been doing around this particular kinase. DCLK1 has been on our radar for, for several years, in part because of this study from Timothy Wong's lab at Columbia, where they identified that there are a subset of DCLK1 positive cells that seem to be quite important in KRAS-driven tumor genesis in the context of pancreatitis. Um, when I was a postdoc in Nathaniel's lab, uh, we also observed that many other groups were actually leveraging chemical probes that were developed by Nathaniel's group for, that were designed to target other kinases, such as this XMD892, which is an ERK5 inhibitor, but investigators learned that it had off-target activity on DCLK1. And so we, we, in the lab, had chemical starting points to be able to perhaps develop small molecule inhibitors targeting this particular kinase. And what we were excited to see from our profiling experiments and then confirming, um, confirming in our various pancreatic model systems was that KRAS seems to be developing this particular understudied kinase. We saw that if we degraded KRAS, we transcriptionally, epigenetically, and at protein level modified um, DCLK1. In addition, this was a target that seemed to be really regulated by MAP kinase signaling. So when we treat with MEK inhibitor, we see loss in, of DCLK1 protein levels. 
teaming up with Kevin Hagis's lab, who has um, KPC um, mouse model, a gem model of pancreatic cancer. Um, performing immunohistochemistry experiments, we saw that over the progression of pancreatic cancer in these mouse models, there's an increase in DCLK1 expression levels. And so this is a KRAS-driven mouse model, which then was recapitulating in um, uh, the increase in DCLK1 levels that we would expect, um, where we were seeing when we degraded KRAS, we saw loss of DCLK1 expression levels. So these types of experiments prompted us to then um, set out on a medicinal chemistry campaign to see if we can target DCLK1 selectively. So teaming up with Fleur Ferguson, a former colleague um, in Nathaniel's lab who started her lab recently at UCSD, we developed this really incredibly selective DCLK1 um, kinase inhibitors I'm showing here in this biochemical kinome-wide kinome scan experiment. We also developed a, um, a small molecule control compound um, where we add this addition of a methyl group abrogates binding to DCLK1 and also has no activity on other ki kinases. So it's a really nice chemical tool to use in parallel. We developed a series of assays to be able to study DCLK1, demonstrate that this molecule has activity in cells, also that it's in vivo compatible and has no adverse effects in zebrafish or mouse models. What we were excited to see when we teamed up with colleagues at Dana-Farber and applied these molecules to evaluations of pancreatic cancer organoids was that we had a, a significant loss of viability of these patient-derived DCLK1 positive organoids in these, uh, these pancreatic cancer organoids. In addition, we saw a nice window of, of effects um, compared to the negative control compound. We also had a number of um, organoids that did not have DCLK1 that we expressed, uh, that we evaluated as controls. And what we found was that our molecule did not have um, activity when DCLK1 was not present. And so this was um, exciting to us, highlighting the selectivity of our molecule and the importance of having intact DCLK1 indeed um, in these organoids as well. We could then perform a number of other functional studies with um, our molecule set now. We performed RNA sequencing experiments and phosphoproteomics um, experiments to evaluate the consequences of DCLK1 inhibition. And we saw that DCLK1 inhibition largely alters motility pathways, apoptosis signatures, and and um, various different potential new substrates that we were identifying and are continuing to follow up on in the lab. And so we're really excited about the potential of both DCLK1 and PIN1 in pancreatic cancer. Um, so just as another quick snapshot, we've had a, a series of publications that have now come out in the past several weeks that I wanted to highlight um, that we've been applying the DTAG approach to be able to study and interrogate various different um, key drivers of various different cancers. Here, um, what I, I just wanted to give references for three of our new papers in AML context. With Scott Armstrong's lab, we've applied our approach to study an MLL fusion, MLAF9, and work led by Naomi Olson in, in the group, leveraging the DTAC system to identify the primary effects of loss of this MLL fusion. With Stu Orkin and Max Pimkin, we've been able to really go after the core regulatory circuitry in AML, looking at MF2D and IRF8 and applying the DTAC system for functional evaluation, really rapidly degrading um, these different transcriptional regulators and looking at the consequences of protein loss. We've also then teamed up in Kim Stegmeier's lab um, to tag and study IRFBB2, a key dependency that they identified in AML context as well. And so in the last a minute or so, I just wanted to really quickly highlight our efforts now to take the DTAC system into mouse models. Early on, what we set out to do was develop a system that would allow us to non-invasively measure and evaluate the potential of our molecules for having activity in vivo. We set up this luminescence-based assay where we tagged luciferase, expressed it in a leukemia cell line, tail vein injected these cells into mice, and then the mice glow. We could then administer our DTAG molecules and look at the consequences of protein loss non-invasively um, in this case. And what we found was that our DTAG molecules just highlighted here with DTAG V1 really led to pronounced robust loss of luminescence signal, indicating that we were able to degrade lu luciferase. From here, then, we've been teaming up with colleagues and collaborators to apply the DTAG system across various different contexts. With our focus in pancreatic cancer, we teamed up with the Arebus lab, who had identified slug as a key transcriptional regulator that was coordinating MEK inhibitor resistance. And what we found in concert with their in vitro studies, identifying slug as this potentiator of resistance, 
that if you combined a MEK inhibitor with degradation of slug, in vivo you had a really pronounced effect of, of, of um, relief of tumor burden in the xenograft model of pancreatic cancer, which was our first demonstration of applying this in a tumor-bearing mouse uh, demonstrating loss of a particular transcriptional regulator. We've also now teamed with Kwok Wong and Hua Zhang at NYU over the past several years to develop the first conditional DTAG GEM model, here largely focusing around KRAS G12B, where we developed a lock stop locks mouse model, which we could then um, introduce adenovirus Cree into the lung of these mice. This leads to um, tumors forming within 10 weeks. And what we've been excited to see is that when we treat these mice with our DTAG compound within hours and, and maintained over days, we can nicely degrade KRAS in vivo in this GEM model in the lung tumor nodules. We can also, as, as hopefully you can appreciate, impact downstream signaling as well in this model. And within two weeks, we see a really dramatic regression of tumor burden. And this um, mouse model has gotten us excited about really applying this approach to an intact mouse a GEM model to really study the consequences of KRAS degradation in vivo and look at the consequences of, of protein loss and, and potentially mechanisms of resistance as well. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of the, the DTAC system, why we developed it, how we've been applying it to various different drug targets, and our ongoing efforts for applying these strategies in vivo. Uh, what I wanted to mention is that we are highly collaborative. We have an open source model for our science. Um, a lot of the materials that are now published that I shared today are on AdGene, um, and our, our compounds are available through chemical um, sources. But we try to put our um, protocols and guidelines freely available, um, which are also on my, my lab website as well. Um, but we are interested in, in partnering up um, with investigators in different fields, so please reach out if we can help in any way. And with that, I'd like to end and thank my lab. Um, I started my lab about six months ago. We're actively recruiting, so please reach out if you're interested um, in any of the science that I talked about. We have many different projects and a lot of uh, funding, so we'd be excited to, to have you and, and chat, so, so please do reach out. Um, many different collaborators to highlight that, um, that hopefully I was able to attribute the work to in our collaborations today, um, as well as prior funding and new funding sources. So thanks so much for your attention and, and time and, and uh, for the invitation um, as well. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Nabet uh, and Dr. Stokes for the wonderful presentations. Uh, we're going to move along to some of the questions submitted by our audience. Uh, just a reminder, if you are watching live, you can still submit your questions by clicking the Ask a Question button on the right, putting your question into the message box, and then clicking Submit. Um, I also wanted to mention that we're um, about five minutes from the official end of the webinar, but we're going to run a little bit long so that we can squeeze a few extra questions in from our audience. So, um, uh, Dr. Nabet and uh, Dr. Stokes, most of the questions appear to have come in for Dr. Nabet. So, uh, Dr. Stokes, I apologize, but please feel free to jump in if you if you have any comments. Um, and the first question is is a fairly broad one, uh, Dr. Nabet. What makes a particular target a good candidate for targeted protein degradation? And are there particular characteristics of the target itself that make it a candidate? Uh, and there was one of our uh, viewers that was asking whether this will work on transcription factors. Great. Yeah, thanks so much for the questions. Those are really, um, yeah, really great questions. I think that there's uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different great candidates for for targeted protein degradation strategies. For us, I think that we've often been um, looking twofold. The first being at particular targets that might have both enzymatic and non-enzymatic functions. So in the example that I shared around focal adhesion kinase, that particular target has a kinase domain, um, is has key enzymatic functions, but also is a key protein-protein scaffold. And so prior techniques might not be able to, to target those other activities like the scaffolding roles. And so by completely depleting the protein, that might actually be an advantageous strategy. And so though, in, in particular, we're particularly focused on those types of candidates where um, a small molecule inhibitor type of approach might be insufficient. Um, I think that, I think a, another question was related to transcription factors. I think there's a large interest in particular in applying these types of strategies towards transcription factors. 
I largely shared um, data and work around these bifunctional molecules or, or protacks, but I, there's a whole emerging um, part of the field focused around what's called molecular glue compounds, which have been shown to be able to uh, really remarkably um, degrade various different transcription uh, factors. And so amongst the early examples were um, these imid molecules that could degrade IKZF1 and IKZF3 as an example. And so I think there's a lot of enthusiasm in the field right now uh, for trying to go after really difficult drug targets like transcription factors with these types of um, approaches. And so I think that largely um, what we're there are all different types of drug targets that we're focused on, and, and those are some of the um, examples that have uh, come out. So just as a follow-up to that, are there any types of targets that you've come across that are not good candidates for degraded technology? Um, and does subcellular localization possibly play a role in determining this? Yeah, uh, also a great question. Thank you. I think that, um, so in terms of uh, areas where there have been difficulties, I think that it, it, it varies. I think that um, there's actually an emerging a class of various different types of these bifunctional molecules that can um, go after um, extracellular proteins or, or, or otherwise or in different cellular compartments that might not be accessible with um, current protax. There might be some organelles um, that we're, we're starting to test and evaluate, but whether or not the molecules could actually degrade um, proteins, for example, um, in the in the mitochondria or in the ER or otherwise, um, I, don't, I haven't seen um, too much data yet to to know whether or not um, those are going to be accessible right now with with the the current um, technologies that are available. So we're starting to think about ways of um, and solutions for overcoming that. So I think that um, overall, it has we and others have shown that you can degrade a membrane bound proteins. Uh, cytoplasmic proteins and, and nuclear uh, factors as well uh, with these various different approaches. But there may be cases as we continue to apply it where they, there are targets that would be inaccessible. But there's a growing sort of community and field in developing bifunctional approaches that hijack other organelles or uh, mechanisms of, of degradation as well to be able to achieve protein loss that are really um, incredibly exciting. Um, and sorry, I've, I'm the first, the first question that you mentioned. I uh, so the, the first question. Yeah, 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 I think you answered all of them. It was whether okay. some protein targets are not good candidates, and then about subcellular localization. Okay, great. Um, so the, the the next question I had is is a kind of specific one. We had some eagle-eyed viewers that noticed that uh, in some a couple of the slides on um, BSJ04146, at a, a thousand nanomolar, um, there was there appeared to be some FAC still present. Uh, is this the hook effect that you were talking about? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a great observation. Thanks. Um, and so in that case, that is indeed what the, the hook effect that we see. So I think that, um, which just as a reminder, what that means is that in, in the case of, of FAC, uh, at those really high doses, because we're seeing degradation around uh, really the sweet spot being 10 to 100 nanomolar, when we go up to one micromolar, um, there's so much um, protac available that we have saturation of FAC, but also the, the E3 ligase. As a consequence, effectively, we're pushing these away rather than forming that productive um, ternary complex. So you see the protein levels um, coming back. And so for early Western blinding experiments that we, when we characterize our molecules in, in dose, we do actually see how far we can push and how much it takes to get to that hook effect in thinking about how um, uh, we're, we're trying to learn a little bit more and see how this then um, emerges or manifests itself to, itself in vivo. Um, but in, in particular, that's what we're seeing um, that is is uh, rightly pointed out by the audience. Yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Stokes, I do have a couple of questions for you. The the first is uh, if uh, if you're creating um, an antibody against a phosphopeptide, a serine. Uh, phosphorylation, and there are two adjacent serines that are phosphorylated. Uh, can you differentiate between the two of them, and, and do you do this in your your um, sort of due diligence on your antibodies? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that we uh, check for when we're validating these antibodies, we want them to react as broadly as possible, right? And so if there's a phosphorylation site that falls into one of these motifs, let's use the one from the talk with the arginine XX and then phosphoserine. We, um, we do like to make sure that it will still bind that motif, even if there's another uh, phosphorylated residue nearby, right? And, you know, same thing for acidic amino acids, right? D's and E's nearby. Is it still going to bind? And then as far as differentiating between which one maybe is phosphorylated, if you get a peptide where they're not all phosphorylated, there are actually metrics that you can use on the uh, kind of searching and score filtering part of this. There's a a score called a score and that's a um, it's a site localization score and it gives you basically what is the confidence that the program that matches mass spec data to peptide sequences has correctly put the phosphate on this site this serine versus a serine that's two amino acids away or maybe even next door and so that's something that we always do is we check these these A scores for multiply phosphorylated peptides or peptides that are singly phosphorylated but have multiple serines, threonines, tyrosines in them. Perfect. Uh, and another quick question for you, Dr. Stokes, um, asking about your experience for targeting glycosylation as a, a post-transcriptional modification. Yeah, so it's it's something that's done quite a bit in the field. One of the things that we do is we actually um, can target silic acid containing uh, glycan groups um, using a specific enrichment and then run that on the mass spec. Uh, that actually works pretty well in serum or plasma samples. Um, and so, yeah, it can be done. And one of the cool things, you know, so, so a, a difficulty can sometimes be you've got the peptide sequence and then you've got the glycan group and, you know, a lot of times in proteomics, it's kind of one or the other. You're going you're gonna to get the peptide ID or you're going to you know, get some idea on what the structure of that glycan is. But we actually have software that we use that allows you to simultaneously look at both the, the peptide sequence, the backbone amino acid sequence, and the glycan group that you're getting on that peptide, which is, I think, pretty cool. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so the next question I have um, for Dr. Nabet is, um, is it possible to titrate the effects of a degrader and do they obey predictable uh, dose response relationships? Oh, great question. Thanks. Yeah, I think in our experience, it is, you, one is able to um, titrate uh, the, the degrader molecule. I think sometimes it takes a little bit of fine tuning and also uh, evaluating across various different time points because that might might change over time. Um, it might just at lower doses be you might see that degradation a little bit slower. But I think overall uh, there are definitely ways to be able to to carefully do that to leverage um, the the small molecules to achieve that that dose dependence to be able to evaluate 50% um, degradation versus 90% degradation, for example. Okay, excellent. So I think we have time for just a, a couple more questions. Um, the next one, uh, Dr. Nabed, is uh, during discovery, what assay, assays are used to evaluate the efficacy of a PROTAC? Oh, great. Yeah, another great question. Thanks. I think that there's a, a, the whole spectrum of assays that one, um, I think, um, can leverage in these types of campaigns to develop PROTACs. I think in, in some respects, um, from the target perspective, um, it might uh, vary based on the particular protein of interest. So I'll just mention, for example, in our with our FAC, FAC um, PROTAC campaign, um, initially, as we synthesize molecules, we perform biochemical experiments. Um, so uh, some binding assays, as well as um, then kinome-wide binding assays, some of which I, I shared. Then we also um, do um, cellular competition experiments. So these molecules are quite large. And so we want to make sure that they're able to get into cells. And if we do not see degradation, is it because they did not get into cells versus they did get in and did not effectively lead to that degradation? So we have various different um, assay setups that are largely luminescent um, based in particular, or our reporter cell lines. 
that allow us to um, start to assess whether or not the molecules are getting into cells and engaging, for example, the E3 ligase or the target of interest. And uh, then for looking at degradation, there's a number of different approaches. Um, if they're great antibodies that are available, such we leverage, I think probably most all the antibodies and Westerns I shared are reagents from um, cell signaling, actually. Um, one can perform Western blotting, but we also do a lot of assays that um, were developed by Promega. And so these include um, Hybit assays or NanoBret assays that allow us more in high throughput um, and kinetically to evaluate um, engagement and protein loss. I think those are highly um, powerful. And then, um, you know, key experiments that we performed that I highlighted uh, several of them to look at selectivity are, are really pr uh, quantitative proteomics experiments to give a broad survey of confirming that you're hitting your target and degrading it, but then what other targets might you be hitting as well that um, one needs to control for. Uh, perfect. So I, I think we have time for one more quick question that I'm going to put to both of you. Uh, that's a, a nice broad question to end with. Uh, what do you see as the future of, of targeted protein degradation? Uh, so um, Nabet, maybe we'll start with you and uh, Matt, you can jump in as well. Okay, great. Yeah, um, love that question. I think that, you know, I'm really excited about um, uh, monitoring the progress in the, the clinic. There's a lot of different um, protex developed and, and pushed forward by, by really great um, industry colleagues that I'm excited to see what kind of clinical impact that they're, that they're making in patients. Um, I'm optimistic that some of our early work and continued work will continue to set up and, and push forward these types of molecules for, for clinical applications in, in can cancers that really need therapies like pancreatic cancer. And so I think the, the future is bright for these types of strategies, whether it's um, protax or glue molecules for really making a, a clinical impact and in, in just going after targets that we've not been able to drug to date, um, like KRAS G12B with these types of approaches, I think is going to be um, really exciting to see. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, from, yeah, from, from my perspective, I think, you know, it's, it's a really exciting field. And, and the thing that uh, I'm really excited about is leveraging proteomics to gain a deeper understanding of what's happening uh, in these degrader systems. And so, you know, uh, Benam had, had great examples today about not just looking at the total proteomics and seeing what's happening with the protein level changes, but really digging into uh, how do these degraders affect signaling, right? And how can we look at some of these post-translational modifications, usually phosphorylation for the signaling, uh, to see what's happening there. And then, and then also looking at things like uh, ubiquitination. So proteomics provides a great way to look at what's being degraded, potential off-target effects, all of these things. So th that's really exciting for me is leveraging uh, proteomics to gain a deeper understanding of, of how the degrader systems are working. Perfect. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, 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 call things to a close here. Um, but uh, before we go, I did want to thank uh, both of our speakers once again, uh, Dr. Ben Amnabet from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and Dr. Matt Stokes from Cell Signaling Technology. Uh, please go to the URL in the resources tab and also on your slide uh, to find out more information related to today's discussion and look out for more webinars from Science available at science.org slash webinar. Uh, this particular webinar will be made available to view again uh, as an on-demand presentation within about uh, 48 hours from now. Uh, we would love to know what you thought of today's webinar. You can send us an email at the address that is now up in your slide viewer, webinar at aaas.org. Uh, again, thank you so much to our speakers and to Cell Signaling Technology for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye, everyone.